Welcome to One on One with Mitch LaFonna. Joining me on this episode from the band Extreme, it is bassist Pat Badger. We talk about their live metal meltdown, porno graffiti, 25th anniversary DVD and CD. We also ask him what he thought of singer Gary Sharon running off and joining Van Halen in the 90s. And yes, of course, what interview would be complete if we didn't talk alpaca farming. That's right, we talk alpaca farming with Pat Badger of the band Extreme. But as always, before checking that out, please check me out on Twitter at Mitch Lafon, M-I-T-C-H-L-A-F-O-N, paypal.me forward slash Mitch Lafon, should you care to support the podcast, and of course, one-on-one Mitch Lafon on Facebook. And yeah, go, go check me on Instagram as well. And with that, here is the one, the only, basis for extreme, Pat Badger. We are speaking with Extremes' Pat Badger. The new album is Pornography Live, 25th Anniversary, also known as Metal Meltdown. Uh, good day, Pat. Pleasure to speak with you. Hey, how are you? Good, good. Now, I actually bought the Japanese version of the album that has two bonus tracks. It is a great, great, um, what do you, I don't, not really a compilation, but it's just a great package. And uh, let's talk about it. Um, All right, yeah, we're we're psyched about it. How yeah, it came out. yeah, it really came out great. So, uh, first of all, talk to me about going back after all these years and actually performing the album in its entirety, and what it's like to revisit some of those songs. Well, you know, we had um, by the time we shot the DVD, um, that was actually like the last show of the tour. So we had uh, kind of worked out all the kinks, and and we were kind of um, pretty well. Uh, you know, we were very comfortable with it by the time we got to, to making the DVD. Um, but, you know, the first few shows were a bit uh, odd for us because, um, you know, there, there were songs that are that kind of come early on the album. Uh, you know, we played the, the album in its entirety from front to back in order, you know. So um, some of the songs that come early on the album were ones that we used to kind of play later in the set. And... Um, you know, even songs like, uh, you know, More Than Words come so early on their record. So it's uh, it was kind of strange for the guys to, you know, sit down on stools in like the fourth song of the night or fifth song, whatever it is. Um, it, uh, you know, so, so it took a little bit getting used to. Um, but, you know, like anything else, once you do it a few times, it's not as, uh, as odd or strange, you know. Right. Talk to me about the temptation, though, to change some of the songs. Because, you know, the fans that are going to the show love the album. They want to hear the album. They they remember it a certain way. But as musicians, sometimes are you not tempted to just say, oh, we could have fixed this. We can make this better. We should change that vocal. We can punch it up here. Um, were you were you tempted to, to change it, or did you really want to say, okay, we'll give them what they're expecting? Well, you know, I think we're... Uh you know, I don't think we're one of those type bands that go on off the uh, beaten path too much. You know, um, it's not like we go on these like five minute improvised solos and that kind of thing. You know, we, we kind of, uh, I think live stick to the script more or less. Um, so, you know, uh, we have room for that, like maybe in other songs or, you know, once we finish the pornography set, we, um, you know, we would play kind of a, a another um, encore of, of songs from the rest of our catalog. And we changed that up every night. So, you know, when we, we did porn graffiti, we kind of did it like, like you said, front to back, even with some of the segues and little sound effects and stuff like that. We wanted to give the fans like the experience of really, um, hearing that album live. So there, there weren't really many surprises as far as the album goes. There was, there was more time in the set for us to kind of, um, you know, to, to kind of change things up from night to night. Where does that leave us now, now that you've done this, where does that leave us in terms of new music coming from the band? Well, we have, um, you know, we have been demoing and, um, you know, writing stuff for the last few years. Um, so there is a, a bit of a, you know, there's, there's a little box of treasures there waiting to be, uh, waiting to be recorded for real you know um i think the uh the process you know it takes takes a bit we live on different coasts so um you know we're not together all the time and rehearsing all the time so we kind of have to you know things have changed a little bit over the band's career where we kind of book time now together to kind of get together and work on new stuff um you know as a band um so 
Yeah, there will be new music in the future. I, I can't really circle a date on the calendar and say this is when we're going to start recording or this is where we're going to, you know, release it. But th- there'll be something coming. You know, the last album that came out in 2008 had one of your greatest songs on there called Star. I just absolutely love that song. Uh, in terms of new music, when it does come, do you look back on the past catalog and say, OK, we need to give the fans another three sides. We need to give the fans another punchline. Or is there sort of a freedom to do whatever you want at this point and, and creatively explore musically anything? Well, I think the band's always um, had that freedom of creatively kind of exploring any anything. We have all different kind of styles and genres on our album and, you know, uh, you know, on all our albums. Um, so I think when we get together or we, you know, write songs for the band, um, you know, we, we just want it to be good material. And, we you know, I don't think we uh, sit down and try to recreate something we did in the past. And we don't, um, you know, we don't have like kind of a contrived way of going about it. It's more just what we feel, you know, where we're at and what, what uh, you know, we'll, we'll figure out which cream rises to the top. If, if you have 20 songs, you know, hopefully 10 of them will be the strongest ones. And and we'll go in and make an album. Yeah, well, we'll look at that. Now, um, you also, in 2014, released Time Will Tell. Was that sort of one and done, you got it out of your system, or is that something you'd like to explore more down the road, more solo albums? Well, um, it's funny you say that, because, you know, Time Will Tell, I did in 2014, and, um, uh, you know, that was definitely spreading my wings a bit, and... Uh, and, you know, obviously I sang a lot, you know, the lead vocals and, and wrote a lot of lyrics and, and um, I definitely had more of it in me. Um, you know, obviously Extreme is, uh, is um, you know, the mothership for me, but uh, it's, it's great to be able to make albums and express myself or write lyrics and that kind of thing. So um, I, I actually just finished an, a new album. And uh, I did it through, again, through pledgemusic.com, which is um, you know, yeah. kind of a fan funding site. Yeah. And uh, the first one I had such a great time doing, and um, it was such a great experience that I did another one this year and uh, just finished it. And um, it's, it's actually, it's a little different than Time Will Tell in that I, <clears throat> I uh, decided to have a pseudo name and create like a fictional band called the nasty ass honey badgers so there you go yeah i sing about half the songs and then i have some guest vocalists sing the other ones um so gary from extreme is on it justin hawkins from the darkness is uh he sings a track and plays some guitar and i get some other great guitar players on it um and it literally just came out and it's uh you know thank you for asking about it so i could plug it shamelessly well, well, and that's the whole purpose, right? Um, and, and by the way, I, you know, Pledge Music does such a great uh, job with what they do. In fact, I had put out an album through them in 2013. It's such a great experience. What does that offer to you in terms of you, a musician to have that kind of service? The fact that you can sort of do whatever you want and go directly to the fans rather than sit with an AOR guy and a this and a that saying, you got to do this, you gotta, I don't hear a single. You know, how, how is it in terms of working with them? Well, the, the guys at Pledge Music are fantastic. And, you know, I, um, you know, it's obviously, it's, it's not like Kickstarter, even though people love to compare it because... You know, on Kickstarter, there are people that are, uh, you know, you could in- invent a can opener and, and have a Kickstarter campaign, you know, where Pledge Music is obviously just geared toward musical, you know, music projects. Um, so the, the, the great thing was for me, you know, really to uh, have a place to, to make an album and reach our hardcore fans and, um, you know, beyond just music, um, there's other content, you know, there's little videos I produced and, you know, you, you kind of bring people along all, all, you know, every step of the way throughout the recording process. And they see behind the scenes footage and all things that, you know, normally we wouldn't have seen back, you know, in the, in the old, uh, you know, system or whatever, yeah. make albums, the old system. Yeah. You'd kind of be like, okay, well, 
you know, I've seen a couple of photos in Circus Magazine that, you know, Van Halen's making a new album, but, it, you know, you, it's not like you're walking in the studio or, or watching video or having, like, you know, some of these uh, VIP experiences. You know, I do stuff where, you know, um, one of the songs was about uh, that I wrote on the new album was about the Salem Witch Trials. So I had a pledge that people could come and meet me in Salem and we'd go on like a, a walking tour and learn about the history of, you know, the Salem witch trials. And, and um, so it was those kind of VIP experiences where fans are actually hanging out and, and we're like, you know, um, doing stuff together where, you know, it's, it's so different than, than uh, you know, just locking your way, like you said, locking yourself away in the studio and then waiting to see if an A&R guy likes your music and, you know, tell yeah. me you, you don't hear a single <laughs> yeah i know that that that's stuff man those old days um i do know that you have to get to another call after so let me let me hit you with a few rapid fire ones here uh, i'm in okay. Mont- i'm in montreal your former manager ray daniels was over in toronto um yep. uh, talk to me about ray because you know he he of course worked with rush uh van halen and others how was he for extreme? How how good was he for the band? How bad was he for the band? Um, what was your experience with Ray Daniels? Uh, Ray is a tremendous guy, and um, you know he's definitely uh, you know he he was in the trenches with Rush uh, from their from their beginnings. You know if you watch the Rush documentary, um, you know he he was like the the fourth member. You know he he. Um, you know, at the time when he took on Extreme, you know, it was a time where the band was kind of, uh, we were struggling a little bit. And, you know, it was it was at the time when kind of grunge was coming out. And it was, it was a bit bad timing when, when I think when Ray took over uh, as management. Um, so, um, you know, the other thing was that he signed Van Halen, like, in the same month that he signed us. So, obviously, we weren't exactly... Uh, the highest priority and you know he was obviously busy with van halen um which you know eventually led to gary um joining van halen for that album which is a whole other story but uh again i got nothing uh but good things to say about ray daniels yeah and and most people who have worked with him have uh good things to say so let's talk about that time around 96 nuno decides that he's going to go do schizophrenia or, or, or the name of that album. So, well, schizophrenic. Schizophrenic. schizophrenic, right? Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Um, sorry, Nuno. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Which, by the way, was a great album, too. Um, and then Gary leaves, or Gary joins Van Halen. When you first heard the news, you know, you get that call and you say, hey, our singer is going to be with Van Halen. Bring me back to that time. What was your reaction? Were you like, oh, great, this is going to be great for Extreme? Or was it like, well, what the hell was that? Um well, you know, it didn't really happen just quite like that. It was more like, um, you know, yeah, there was a disappointment when Nuno wanted to, um, you know, he basically, you know, wanted to leave the band. You know, Gary and I were saying to him, listen, get the, get it out of your system. Go make, you know, schizophonic, um, but don't break up the band. You know, we'll, we'll be here. You come back and we'll do another extreme album. Uh, but at the time, his heart wasn't in it, and he just said, you know, I want to, you know, go pursue this solo career. And so, you know, what can you say? It's like a girl breaking up with you, you know, or or whatever, you know. Um, there wasn't talking him talking talking him back into it, you know, or out of it, I should say. Um, so at the time, Gary and I were in conversations about, well, what are, you know, what are we going to do? Are we going to uh, just, you know, call it quits? Should we see if there's another guitar player out there that we can continue on? I mean, it won't be the same without Nuno, but, you know, sure, plenty of bands have had, um, you know, replacements. So, and it was at that time when, uh, you know, Van Halen was looking for a singer. And, you know, I knew throughout the whole process that, you know, Gary's like, you know, I got a call from Ray that, uh, you know, I, I should go down and audition for Van Halen. And, you know, growing up, Van Halen was one of my favorite bands of all time, still to this day. They're like one of my favorite bands. So I'm like, I was supportive of Gary saying, you know, you should go for it, man. That's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And um, I remember being on the phone with him and he, I'm helping him decipher David Lee Roth lyrics to Panama. And I'm like, <laughs> is okay, that so actually doable? 
I swear to God, I remember sitting on my porch saying, you know, ain't no uh, pistons popping, be no stopping now. And he's like, that's what he's saying? I'm like, yeah, that's what he's saying. So I, he, I, I was on the phone with Gary. He's like, I'm out here. He, I, I use it at Eddie Van Hills uh, at 5150. He's like, Pat, I, you know, I'm really hitting it off with them. I, I think I got the gig. And so I wasn't like shocked by a phone call later. I was kind of like in the process, like, you know, um, cheering them on. So, um, yeah, it was, it was an odd time, but, uh, that's how, kind of, you know, that was kind of how it went down. So, so let me, let me follow up with two questions to that. First of all, are you glad, uh, looking long-term that you didn't replace Nuno and that you sort of took that break and came back? And second of all, as a Van Halen fan, what did you think of Gary's performances with the band? Cause I mean, I personally thought he did a great job live. So, well, I, um, Again, you know, I, I in hindsight, yeah, I'm glad that we did not, you know, try to replace Nuno with someone else. Um, although the 10 years off was a painful, like, you know, I, I feel like a, in hindsight, you know, there were definitely some of my years in my life that were, that were, uh, you know, I, I would have been in my prime to go out and play shows and tour the world and, and, um, you know, we always kind of felt like it was unfinished business with Extreme, so it wasn't a matter of uh, if the band would get back together, it was when the band got back together. So, you know, things ran its course, and it's been great since 2006 we've been working together. And, um, you know, as far as uh, Gary's tenure in Van Halen, um, I mean, let's face it, it was it was a... Uh, it was tough shoes to, to step into no matter who tried to, to do it. People wanted Dave back. They, um, or they were Sammy fans and didn't want a new singer. So Gary um, really was, uh, you know, put into a very uh, tough position and he had to have like elephant skin with people like giving him the finger, you know, when he's on stage. Um, but like you said, I, I thought his performances were fantastic with, uh, you know, he, he um, you know, they started playing songs that the Van Halen fans hadn't heard in years, you know, because Sammy yes, wasn't exactly. a lot of game stuff. So like Mean Streets you know, and stuff, you know? Yeah, when they open up with Unchained or something, it was like people hadn't heard that since, you know, since 1984. So the shows were tremendous. Um, the album, I think, you know, um, I, I get to spend a little bit of time up at uh, at the studio when Gary was up there. And it seemed like, you know, Ed was kind of running the show and the producer really had little to nothing to do with the album. And I think it was kind of, um, you know, the the album um, could have been better. Yeah. Uh, Let me, you know, the, the I, album, I, it wasn't Gary's fault. Everyone assumes, oh, it's, you know, the new singer's fault. But I think it was uh, the whole process. It, it just wasn't, uh, you know. Yeah. And I think that that's an important thing for fans to remember that had the material been stronger, had it been another Unchained or So This Is Love, and Gary had been the singer, he probably would maybe still be the singer. So I don't think it was his fault. Um, l let me just get over to this other thing here that, that I find fascinating from your, your I guess, personal life or history, uh, alpaca farming. Um, <laughs> I, I think that's absolutely uh, fascinating. Talk to me about alpaca farming. Are you still doing it? Um, sort of what are the challenges? Just, just well, lay it out for me. All right. I'll back the bus up to when, uh, right. you know, when the band broke up, right. I was look. I was obviously a bit, um, disenchanted with the music industry, you know, grunge had come and kind of swept a lot of bands from our era under the rug. Um, my band broke up. I was like, you know, I just want to do something completely different from music. I was tired of really, you know, traveling, um, living on a tour bus, you know. So um, I had a farm, but the barn was empty. The previous owners had had like horses. And, you know, I was just looking for something to do with myself that I could sink my teeth into. And I found out about alpacas and that they were, you know, you could – you know, I started taking them to, uh, or I started visiting alpaca shows, which were kind of like a dog show or a livestock show. And, um, you know, talking to other people that were breeding them and I'd see, you know, go to auctions and this kind of thing. And, and I just like, you know, 
kind of fell in love with the the animals and the whole uh, vibe of, you know, some of the people I was meeting and traveling, you know, just doing something different from music. Um, so, you know, that was, uh, um, that was, you know, I met, uh, you know, some lifelong friends and, and had a lot of fun, uh, doing the alpaca thing. Uh, of course, you know, with the downturn of the economy, the, the, that business also struggled and had some, you know, um, the price of alpacas went down. So, I, you know, I, I don't really do it like I was in those days, um, you know, with showing them and taking them to auctions. I just have a few in the backyard as kind of like, you know, pasture pets and they're fun to have around. Um, but, you know, so there, there's still a few of them are still with me, but it's not like a business like I was running back when the, you know, back in the uh, day. Yeah. Um, now I see we're down to, to like about two minutes here. So, um, Two last questions. Uh, quickly, Tribe of Judah you did back in the early 2000s. Is that something at some point you and Gary might resurrect, or has that been been there, done that, we're extreme, nothing else? Well, that was kind of Gary's baby. You okay. know, he, um, he um, you know, creatively and everything, he, he uh, wanted to do something when, obviously, extreme was, um, in, 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 and that came after the Van Halen thing. So, um, you know, we did one album. He's He's asked me actually pretty recently he said you know it's you know he he's he's doing something with his brother and um some friends called hurt smile which is uh another kind of side project for gary yep. uh, i've been i've been doing you know like you said like we talked about earlier some of my own solo stuff and sometimes he said to me oh we should you know just record a few songs with the guys from tribe of judah and just you know just put it out there who cares if we give it away for free it's just you know creatively it gets our you know uh it, it serves a purpose and so who knows maybe we'll uh we'll call mike me and Jeannie and do another tribe of judah tune sometime um but it's not something like we're uh you know again it's not it, in the forefront extreme's, yeah extreme's always the mothership and we'll we'll uh we'll we'll uh always do extreme but all these other things are just fun side projects and uh, let me finish on this. Years ago, I was talking to a Doug Feger of the Knack, and he was telling me that My Sharona was sort of a golden albatross. That the song was so big that it paid for his pool and his house and this and that, and that was great. But musically, every record company guy said, well, you're not writing another My Sharona, so it sort of in the long run hurt the Knack. Um, the point getting I'm getting to is more than words. Is, is that a song that just became so big that it 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 benefits the band or at some point everybody in the record company goes, yeah, I don't hear another more than words. Let's try that again. Like, is it sort of a good and bad more than words? Well, again, you know, um, I guess every, uh, it's, it's hard to, to really say, I mean, how can you complain about having a number one hit? And, right. you know, that definitely put us on the map and we're obviously, you know, but, but yeah, there was a point where you refused today, to play it. You know, people know the song, but don't know who sang it or know the name of the band, you know? So it, it, the, the song is in some ways bigger than the band. Um, but you know, how can you complain about that? So, um, you know, we, we're not in the position now where when we make records, you know, people are telling us, Oh, we need another more than words. You know, that was kind of a, it was a very different type song for the band. You know, like I said, we've, we've always had very, uh, various um, influences and uh, the song doesn't sound like a lot of our other songs. Um, so there were some elements to that where I think people expected an album of more than words and didn't realize that we were more of a hard rock band um, at the time. So um, again, you know, how, how can you complain about it though? So um, yeah, you can't, but I mean, you, you did refuse to play it on the punchline tour though. You sort of went, yeah, we're not playing that. Right. Well, first of all, I've I've never played it because I'm. Oh. I, it was only a duet between that and Gary Nuno. Well, of so course. So at the time, those guys, uh, I think, were burnt out on it and decided. And it, that was, you know, even in hindsight, they laugh at it and say, "Yeah, that was kind of stupid." That was like, you <laughs> yeah. know, kind of a, um, you know, <laughs> I don't know what we were thinking, but um, uh. Anyway, they they uh, they play it, and every crowd sings along, and it's it's an amazing song, and yeah. um, you know. So what can you say? 
Yeah, no, it certainly is. Uh, Pat, great pleasure today. Thank you so much. And uh, there you go. We're finished, so you can get to the other call. Perfect, perfect timing. All right. Pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Pat. Bye-bye now. All right, thanks. Cheers. And there you have it, folks, my interview with extreme bassist Pat Badger. Do check out their new live Pornography 25th anniversary CD and DVD, also known as The Metal Meltdown. Do check me out on Twitter at Mitch LaFon, Facebook one-on-one Mitch LaFon. Instagram is Mitch underscore LaFon, and, of course, paypal.me forward slash Mitch LaFon, should you care to support the podcast. And with that, I bid you a fond, fond farewell. And, uh, well, there you go. That's it. We're done. Out of here. Turn out the lights. Close the door. Put on the we're closed for business sign. Bye for now.